As a mark of respect to the Word of God, we'd like to stand. We are going through the book of John as best we can on Sunday mornings. And we are now in chapter 3. Last week it was uh, on zeal for the house of God. The zeal of thine house had eaten me up. Chapter 3 this morning. I'll read verse 1 down to verse 15. We are in the chapter that has probably the most well-known verse in the Bible. John chapter 3. Anybody know what the most well-known verse is? 16? Do you know what 15 says? <laughs> You'd find that out, all right? Um, I try not to keep you in this mass for very long this morning, so pray for me. But um, we're dealing with a very, one, probably one of the most important subjects in the Bible here. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. A ruler, a ruler of the Jews. So he's obviously a very influential man, a very well-respected man, and um, probably a very moral man, most likely would be. The same, that Dinkodemus, came to Jesus by night. And some people condemn him for coming in the night, but I don't think, I think he was just trying to wait until Jesus had a little time because Jesus Christ is quite busy during the day. He came by night and said unto him, Rabbi, the word rabbi means teacher, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So obviously this very well influential man, religious man, recognized something different about Jesus. He said, you, you have to come from God. But at this point, he's still not sure Jesus is God. He said, I don't even think Jesus finished. Allow him to finish what he's saying. As soon as he said that, here's what the text says. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? <laughs> can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? You know, you know, he's thinking physical only, right? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's pretty emphatic. That's very definite. That's very narrow, very conclusive. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, he must be born again. The wind blew it where it lifted, it, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it come or whither it goeth. So, and don't lose that little word right there. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, <laughs> How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe them not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now you know what verse 15 says. Amen. Father, bless your word to heart today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Appreciate those of you visiting with us this morning. We, we take some time shortly afterwards to greet you. But we really appreciate you visiting us. And those of you who might be sharing, uh, or watching this video by live stream, please go ahead and share it. Somebody else could get it. Because this particular subject is something that every single person should be extremely concerned about. My question to you this morning is, are you born again? You say, Pastor, why are you asking the church that? Everybody here, I've heard that many times. You've got to be born. Jesus said you must be born Again, and probably one of the most controversial subjects in religion today is the subject of 
the new birth. What is the new birth? Are you born again? Because I don't think you missed this. Jesus said to Nicodemus, probably one of the most religious men in, in, in Israel at the time, he said to him, you must be born again. Even Nicodemus was confused and he asked, how can a man be born when he's old? And he's thinking that, well, it's impossible to have a second birth because to have a birth, he's, he's thinking human, yeah, he's thinking physical. And by the way, even if it was possible to get back in your mom and become a little fetus and grow again and be born physically, do you know that still would not allow you to get to heaven? Even if you had two physical births, you can't go to heaven. Because there's another birth he's talking about right here. And even Nicodemus was confused. We'll get to this. What is the new birth? How can someone be born again after they have already been born? Are there any evidences we should look for? Why is it so important to be absolutely accurate about this subject? Well, Jesus said, except a man is born again, he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. And I know you, if you're here this morning, you want to ensure that you enter the kingdom of God. You know, that's why people go to church. Some people, I mean, not Calvary Baptist folk, they know better than that. They go to church because they're saved. Amen. Amen. But do you know that people go to church, they go into buildings of religious orders and religious services thinking that that's part of the process of going into the kingdom of God. Now I want to clarify that this morning to those of you listening to me and those of you listening to my live stream. Here it is. Jesus Christ laid down an exclusive condition. Except a man is born again. A man there also means women. Except a man is born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. So how is someone born again? And after reading the words of Christ on this subject, um, it's probably, it may seem appropriate to entitle the message, How to be born again. But I think, as you would see later on, that that, not, that may not be a fully accurate terminology because the new birth is not a matter of technique. You see, when you say how to, you're giving somebody a technique, a plan, a process as to how to achieve something. Um, the new birth is not a human formula that you follow. So I chose not to entitle the message, how to be born again. I chose rather to entitle the message, the new birth. And that is the context, and that is the subject of this particular text. The new birth. Jesus is dealing with the new birth. So we're going to stay with what I believe the Holy Ghost wants us to stay with, and not sort of, uh, I don't know, humanize this by putting the question, how to be born again? Well, you might ask, how can a man be born again? That's fine, but to say how to be born again is to imply that we are suggesting a technique, a formula. The new birth is not a human formula. Of course, the most tragic consequence await those who die not being born again. And if you were deceived in this area and you're alive today, you have an opportunity to hear the truth. Because one of the most dreadful awakening that awaits those who think they're saved and they're not will be to find out after death that they were not born again. Jesus quickly reminded Nicodemus that he needed more than just a rabbi, just a teacher. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. He says, I realize that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need more than a, you need more than a teacher. You need a savior. In order to avoid all confusion in this area, let us hear Jesus expound on the greatest blessing of life. This wonderful reality called the new birth. And I, I, I'm trying not, well, 
they say I have to stay six feet away from you because I'm not wearing a mask. So let me talk to you this morning. Amen. Number one, the new birth is an absolute necessity. Let me read again. John 3, verse 3, verse 5, verse 7. Stay with me. It's like we're doing Bible study this morning because I don't want you to miss this. The new birth, first point, is an absolute necessity. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, and he's talking to a very religious man. Actually, he's talking to a religious teacher. He's talk, in today's world, we would say he's talking to a preacher. A leader in religion. Preachers, friends, brothers and sisters. There are many leaders in religion that are not born again. And if they're not born again, according to Jesus' words in John 3, verse 3. They will not and cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily. Now the word verily, verily, is actually of Hebrew origin, but it's here in the Greek language, in the original language of the New Testament here. It's the word pronounced in Greek. Amen. Amen. Every time you say amen, you say verily. In other words, you're saying that's true. That's trustworthy. That's firm. That's sure. So Jesus used it twice. He said to Nicodemus, Amen, amen. Except you're born again. You're not going to heaven. Can't even see it. And the word see there is another word that has to do, it's figurative and it's also literal. It means you cannot perceive anything of the kingdom of God. You're, you, you're a natural man who receives not the things of the spirit of God. Spiritual things mean nothing to you. You cannot perceive. In other words, you don't understand how the kingdom of God functions or works. Or you don't even understand how the kingdom of God influences people to live differently. That, that does not cross your mind. You can't figure that out. You can't see the kingdom of God. You cannot perceive or grasp the things of the kingdom because the things of the kingdom are opposite to the thing of the kingdoms of this world. So if you are not born again, you cannot even perceive. I mean, you wonder how could somebody come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night? How they could read a book that's been written three, four thousand years ago and find in this book things that are relevant to their lives right now. Things that are relevant to their marriages right now. Things that are relevant to their children right now. Things that are relevant to their money right now. Things that are relevant to the way they think right now. Things that are relevant to their education right now. In a book that was written three, four thousand years ago. You say, preacher, how? The new birth changes your perception. And you cease being a Sunday morning Christian. You know why? You perceive something that somebody else has not perceived because anybody who is born again is changed. I'll show you in the text. Let's not deceive ourselves, folks. Jesus himself laid down this absolute condition. He said it three times. Amen, amen. And then he said, except a man be born again. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Question again this morning. Are you born again? If you're not, 
You cannot see nor enter. You cannot perceive nor enter. The only people who enter the kingdom of God are people who are born again. The new birth is an absolute necessity. And it's an absolute necessity because of man's depravity. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by man's depravity? Well, human depravity is a theological term used to mean that men are void of original righteousness. They are corrupt as far as the human nature is concerned. And we have a defaulted position, a defaulted propensity towards sin and evil. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 7 verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Depravity means that men lack original righteousness. Because all our righteousness, all Nicodemus' righteousness was like filthy rags in the sight of God. Depravity means, and we don't hear that, yes, we don't hear that preached much. We hear a lot about um, how good you are and you know, if we could pump you up, you'll, be, you'll get into God's blessing. You ever heard that? Many religious leaders today are making it such that man becomes the measure of all things. And the bigger you are, the better you are. And God says, no, the smaller you are, the better you are. But there's a movement in, in religion today to, uh, it's almost like motivational speaking. To make the person feel good. So they come to church and if they feel good, they say, I've been blessed. Listen, my friend, if you come to church and all you feel is good, God help this little old preacher. I have violated a trust. Because every now and then, church, I want to come to the house of God and not feel good, but get convicted. Yes. Amen. I want the Holy Spirit to reveal my ways that are contrary to the ways of Jesus. I want the Holy Ghost to reveal character traits that are contrary to the character traits of Jesus. I want the Holy Ghost to decrease self and exalt the Son. If I'm always feeling good and I'm feeling I'm entering into my blessing and I'm feeling that I'm becoming and embracing my destiny. That has become a spiritual drug in most churches. It's a feel good. And if they don't feel good, the pastor didn't bless them. I'm not going back to that church because I didn't feel good. Well, guess what you're doing? You're living on feelings. And the worst, listen my friend. The worst foundation for decisions is feeling. Because your emotions are driven by feelings. And God says, no, your mind must be driven by facts. Tell me the truth, praise God. Even though it doesn't hit me too well, tell me the truth. I mean, I come back, but tell me the truth. Amen? I'm glad Jesus, you know, Jesus could have taken Nicodemus' compliment. Yes, Nicodemus, you realize I'm, I'm, a, great, I'm a great teacher. Um, I do miracles. Because, you know, Nicodemus came with a compliment. Jesus ignored the compliment to tell this brother. Well, he wasn't a brother yet. I think he got saved eventually. But Jesus ignored the compliment he was not interested in making Nicodemus feel good. He said, let me tell you something, Nicodemus. What's important here is not whether or not I'm a teacher. What's important here is you must be born again. 
The new birth is an absolute necessity. And it's a necessity because of human depravity. And depravity means all men lack original righteousness. All men have a bias towards evil. It also means that man cannot by his own volition change his character. He cannot self-actualize. As those wicked psychologists tell us in college. B.F. Skinner, Pavlov, you name them. You, you, you cannot, so to speak, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can't. Why? Depravity. Man is helpless to save himself. He cannot change his character and he cannot change his life to make it conform to the laws of God. Neither can a man of his own change his, as one man says, his fundamental preference to self and sin. You could do what you want with yourself. You would find that you would always, and I would always too, as a human being, always gravitate towards me, self. It's all, the bottom line is this. What is in this for me? You know where that came from? <laughs> that came from our forefather, a guy named Adam. Who changed his focus on God and pleasing God. And satisfying the righteous, the, uh, the, the God's righteous des desire and design for him. To be me. That's what Satan said to them. You shall be as God, knowing good and evil. You're going to have your own little self as God. Uh, that's the essence of depravity, friend. And we know depravity does not necessarily mean that all men will go into all types of sins. You know, most people here have not killed anybody or do drugs or, you know, um, involved in some big racket tearing. And you have not been involved in mass murders and. And, you know, you see the vileness that people do uh, as they allow the depravity to move on. But what the Bible is teaching me is that if you look at the worst sinner, Hitler, well, he's not the worst anyway, but um, he killed six million Jews. But, uh, you know, Planned Parenthood had killed over 60-something million babies over the last 40 years. So I think they're worse than Hitler. You say, Pastor, these are bad guys. Guess what? Depravity means... That you and I, even though we may not go to that extent of sin, we have the potential. That's depravity. But people, they are, are told how basically good they are. And God says, there is none good. There is not a good man on the earth. There is not a righteous man on the earth. There is none righteous. And that's why you need a new birth. Because since... We have a fundamental preference for self and sin instead of supreme love for God, which is the basics of the law. The law says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Two commandments. The whole law is summarized. The whole, all of the Old Testament is summarizing these two, these two commandments. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Depravity means I have broken the first commandment even before I could speak. Babies themselves demonstrate selfishness without knowledge of sin. You ever, wanna, you ever think about that? Where did that come from? It came from our forefathers, a guy named Adam. That's why the new birth is an absolute necessity because of man's depravity. But it's also because of man's incapacity. He cannot see and he cannot enter. So no reformation, no reincarnation, no moralization, no turning a new leaf every new year will make us righteous. Coming inside the church does not make you a Christian either. Because if that's the case, then going into a garage will make you a car. The new birth is the critical matter, folks. And Jesus made this religious guy know that up front. Jesus refused the compliment. 
He said, let's get to the, ma- let's get to the business, Nicodemus. I know your heart. I can see dung in your heart. I know why you came. You've been under conviction. You're puzzled. You're not sure about this Jesus. But you, you don't really want your friends to know. You come up in the night and you want to talk to me and you want to give me a compliment. So hopefully you probably will buy me onto the side of the Pharisees. And Jesus looked straight down in the man's heart and said, let me tell you something, Nicodemus. You are, you are, you are a religious leader in, in Israel, but you are depraved. Now watch me. In chapter, in chapter 3, he deals with Israel's best. And in chapter 4, he deals with Israel's worst, the Samaritan woman. But both of them needed the new birth. So it's not a matter of how many sins you committed. The new birth is needed if you have had one birth. If you were ever born physically, you need the second birth to get to heaven. Amen, church. Am I saying what I can say? Come on, come on. Help me now. Don't let false prophets deceive you, folks. Depravity is real. And man needs a new birth because of his depravity, but also because of his incapacity. Um, He cannot see. He cannot enter. But also, secondly, the new birth is of divine chemistry. Look at me in the word of God, please. Verse number five. He was, Jesus was answering Nicodemus' question in verse 4. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Of course, he's thinking physical. And Jesus answers in verse number 5. Jesus answers, amen, amen. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, And of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. There's a divine chemistry here in the new birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Except a man be born of water and the spirit. And I've said this to Calvary before, you know that. Most people, or many people, who preach what you call baptismal regeneration believe that when they dip in the baptismal pool and they get up that they're born again they believe that water in this text refers to water baptism so they say pastor you have to be baptized and the spirit and then you say is that what it means? And Calvary says no. Where did they get the answer for that? <laughs> the word water in that particular text has absolutely nothing to do with baptism. First of all, because, and I'll give you some scriptures. Time is going here. I may have to give you. Water baptism in the Bible is never used. Let me get a little closer to you to see this. I try to keep the six feet, brother. Don't worry. Water baptism in the Bible is never used, study your Bibles now, is never used in conjunction with birth. It's always used in conjunction with death. Come on, come on, Bible scholars. What do you read in Romans chapter 6? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was Raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. For as we were planted together in the likeness of his death, help me, baptism is always a symbol, a picture of death, burial, and resurrection. Never the new birth. Never the new birth. Furthermore, we have scripture to prove that the word water here refers to the word of God. The divine chemistry is that the Holy Spirit takes the word of God. The word that you hear. And produces the new birth in your spirit. So we have to have these three. I don't like to say elements because God is not element. But for lack of a better word. 
You have to have the word, the water. Well, you say, Pastor, well, help me a little bit. Psalm 119 verse 9. Where it all shall a man, young man cleanse his way? By taking it thereto according to the, the word cleanses. Okay? John 4. Well, you, you kind of close by there. So let's look at it. John 4, 13 and 14. And I know time's going here. I just, oh my God. Ah, Lord, help me. John 4, verse number 13 and 14. He's talking to this woman at the well. We're coming to that later. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water, that's been the physical water in the well, shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into the word produces everlasting life. Let's go on. Let's just in case you can. No. Ephesians 5, 25, 26. Ephesians 5, 25, 26. I have to s stress this because it's, uh, it's one that uh, many, of peop many people miss and they don't quite know how to defend. But look at me in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Talking about the marriage, but also referring to Christ and the church. He says this. Ephesians 5, you're there now? 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might what? sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by what? The word. The word is used to give life and cleanse. Let's go on. One more. First Peter chapter 1. Let me find my text right here. I'm going to get this here. First Peter. Almost at the end of the Bible now. We're going through the scriptures. First Peter 1. 23. This one is as plain as you could get it. That's what we call scripture interpreting scripture. Here it is. Being, church, we need to read this together. Come on, because I'm not. Being what? Born again, not of corruptible seed. Holy Spirit, that's the, if the word is corrupted, it can't produce the new birth. Not of corruptible seed. But of what? Incorruptible. By what? The word of God which liveth and abideth forever. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, except you're born of this chemistry of the word and the spirit, you cannot be saved. Here's how it happens. The Holy Ghost of God takes the word of God that you hear and produces faith in your heart. And that new birth is created, my friend, as that, 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 uh, that sinner responds. Depravity does not allow, does not mean that he cannot respond. You know, Calvinistic people believe that uh, depravity is such that you cannot even respond to the Spirit of God. But no, the Bible doesn't teach that. The sinner hears the word of God and the word produces faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word and the faith that the word of God produces is the saving faith that you redeposit in Jesus Christ and you're born again. Now let me finish this because time is gone. I'll just skip this because I think I give you something to think about here. The new birth is an absolute necessity because of man's depravity, because of man's incapacity. The new birth is of divine chemistry. The water which is the word the Spirit, this Holy Ghost, and the human spirit. Look at, look at me in the text. Go with me back again. Go, go back again. John chapter number 3. John 3. I just want scripture to speak, my friend. That's all I have here. John 3. Follow me. You mark it in your Bibles if you got it there. It says right here. In John 3. Verse number. Where am I here? Verse number 6. That which is born of the flesh is, is flesh. That's corrupt. It doesn't mean that the flesh per se is corrupt. It just means that the flesh is the seat where the fleshly nature is manifested. But let's go on. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And if you have a King James Bible, you would have one spirit with capital S and one spirit with a small s. The capital S spirit is the Holy Ghost, and the small spirit is your spirit. So that which is born of 
Listen to this. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit, that means born of the Holy Ghost. The, the new body is a miracle. And only God can perform miracle. You cannot born yourself, so to speak. There is such a word. It's a divine act. But notice, born of the spirit is spirit. So when you get born again, God comes into your spirit. And your spirit is born anew. The Holy Ghost, God puts a new nature inside of your spirit. And that new nature is himself. So now the saved person, the born again person, has their human spirit. And dwelling in their human spirit is God. That's the only confidence you have that you'll enter heaven. Amen? And then as the spirit dwells inside your, your spirit, your spirit is made, the Bible tells me here that the Holy Ghost seals, he seals you until the day of redemption. So once he comes into your spirit, he doesn't leave. You have eternal life. Then your soul and your body, which are outside, which are, you know, the other parts coming out, the spirit is the inner part. The spirit of God inside your spirit begins to work on your soul. And begin to transform your soul to develop the character of Jesus Christ. It's called sanctification. And then as the sanctification is working in your soul, it begins to show out to your body. That's why your hands don't touch these things anymore. And that's why your eyes don't look at that stuff anymore. And that's why you don't go dancing down the road anymore. And that's why you leave the liquor alone and you, 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 you empty your fridge of 345 and all beer, Corona beer. Why would you call it? Anyway, you, you empty your stuff of that, mirror and you, you dump the music. You know why? You know, the reason why you dump the music is not so you could get born again. You dump the music because the Spirit of God came inside your spirit and began to change your soul. And then your soul, look around and say, wait a minute. This thing that my body is doing does not match with Jesus Christ. Let me get rid of it. Then the Holy Ghost says, wait a minute, since you have dumped the old music, let me show you what good music you can put into your spirit. Let me show you what good songs you can listen to. Let me show you that you need to cut off all these crazy people on TV. Let me show you that God is pleased when you come to church. And God is pleased when you read your Bible. And God is smiling when you tell others about Jesus. The reason you're doing that is because of an intrinsic motivation. The Holy Ghost of God inside of you that changed your spirit. Don't say amen. Say verily, verily. <laughs> amen, church. Okay. We won the mass long enough. Let me close this. I said the new birth is an absolute necessity. The new birth is of divine chemistry. The new birth is a mystery. I'll hasten the last couple points. Look at me quickly. The wind blow it where it listed, and thou hearest the song thereof. Canst not tell where it cometh, where it goeth. So, so, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. The new body is a mystery. You cannot see the Holy Ghost. You didn't even see when he came into your spirit. But you can testify of his power inside of you. The change. Let me ask you the question. Has there been a change since you said you were born again? Because the Holy Ghost, the Bible, the Bible compares it here to the wind. We don't see the wind, but we see the power of the wind. We see the wind moving stuff. You ever see it? Oh, I, I see, I see the wind. No, no, no. You only see the effects of the wind. The Bible says, so is everyone born of the Spirit. You cannot have someone as big as God come into your spirit and give you the new birth and there are no effects. Because the new birth is a mystery. It's invisible, but real and effectual. It's inexplainable, but real 
and substantial. It's not a matter of technique, but it's a matter of transformation. It's a new life. It's not religious education. Religious education is probably one of the greatest abominations on the planet. Religious education. Religious education is where you take children and you catechize them. You teach them religious Christian philosophy to hopefully get them to become Christians. That's religious education. You do not get born again through religious education. When you get saved, God gives you Christian education. Amen? Amen. So, the new birth is not religious education of gradually raising a child in the Christian philosophy so they will find God. But it's good to teach children the word of God. No, don't, don't get me wrong. But we don't educate people into the new birth. We preach the word of God and the spirit of God in a mysterious act of God produces the new birth to the believing heart. Invisible, but real. Inexplainable, but real. Not technique, transform transformational. New life, not religious education. My friend, we can't see the spirit, but we can see the life changed by the power of the invisible Holy Ghost. All of a sudden, this, drunk, this guy that was a drunken drug addict on the street is pure and clean and sober. This girl that was not behaving well. All of a sudden, she wants to dress right. She wants to find a place to be in the house of God. She's looking at things that are pure. What happened? Mystery. God came into her soul. Change her. The new birth is a mystery, but lastly, and probably most importantly, I may have to hammer this next time. The new birth is possible only because of Calvary. Amen? Amen. Let's go to it and I'll close. I know we, time is going to five minutes past 12. Let's stop this here. I don't know about you. I'm enjoying the word here. It's just amazing what the word of God is. And then I'm going to ask you again. Are you, being, are you born again? Let me read this. Jesus Christ took Nicodemus all the way to the end of it. And he drew, the, he drew the, what we call, he drew the net. He told him the new birth is an absolute necessity. He told him the new birth is of divine chemistry. He told him the new birth is a mystery. But he also told him that the new birth is accomplished only because of Calvary. Let's jump down here a little bit. It says, as Moses, verse 14 as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, there's another so, even so, there's the next word, must, the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. You know why he picked that, I believe? Because Nicodemus read the Old Testament. And he would have read Numbers 21. Remember that? When the, the soap got, because the people were complaining and they were cussing Moses and cussing God and finding fault with everything and they were murmuring and God says, I, I don't like murmuring. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge them for murmuring. And God sent poisonous snakes in the camp and the snakes would crawl in the midst of the people and bite them. And as the snake bit them, the poison began to move through their bloodstream and in a few minutes, they were dead. That was worse than coronavirus. I guarantee you. Snakes crawling. And you know, the people lived in tents out there in the wilderness. Two and a half million of them were complaining, fretting Moses. And God, is, God hates murmuring. God hates complaining. So God sent the snakes and they beat them. And as people began to just fall and die, they cried, oh God, Moses, Moses, help us. Cry to God. Moses cried to God. God said, Moses, what I want you to do is get a snake. Make a, make a, make, get some brass. Make, make a stick of brass. Make something that looks like the thing that's biting them. And put it, on a, put it up on a pole in the middle of the camp. And tell them, 
Anytime a snake bites you and the poison begins to move through your bloodstream, just look. Just look on the snake on the pole and you'll be healed. <laughs> look and you live. And Jesus comes in the New Testament and says to Nicodemus, you remember that story of the Old Testament? That was actually a type of me who would become sin on the pole, the cross. You say, Pastor, what's the analogy? Well, the brass serpent looked like the thing that bit them, but it had no poison. The brass snake could do nothing. Jesus is the antitype. He who has no sin became sin. He resembled the thing that's biting them and killing them. But guess what? Jesus as the antitype. He takes the judgment of sin and the poison of sin that would have killed me. He took it on my behalf. And there on the cross, the perfect Lamb of God became sin. He had no sin in himself. He's God. But he allowed himself to be placed on a pole. And an Israelite would get that immediately. Because the Israelite knew that it was not, it was not the, the idea that they got bitten. It was when they looked, they lived. Faith. Not in the, listen, my friend. Faith in what God said. And Jesus said, as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so. And Jesus Christ was lifted up on that pole in the middle of human history. So that if you look to him by faith. And you say, yes, I recognize it when you hung there, Lord. You took God's wrath on my behalf. You stayed there. With my sins on you. Get me, get me. My sins, every one of them, was placed upon Jesus. And he, because he had sin on him, no sin in him. Get me? I have to make this clear. No sin in him, but sin was placed on him. He bore our sins in his body. On the tree. And when he did that, even his heavenly father, who loves him, could not spare him. He could not spare him. Because anyone who bears sin must die. He bore sin on behalf of humanity. And any human who looks by faith, the effects of that cross is transferred to that sinner in a transaction called the new birth where that sinner now has the complete, perfect righteousness of God, exactly what God is asking for, credited to his account because the judgment of his sins has been paid in full. Nicodemus got it. And when Jesus said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And the next verse, he also said to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave the cross, serpent on the pole, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but will what? Have. That's the same thing as having the new birth. I have to stop there because time. Let me ask you this. Would you bow your head with me? Have you been born again? 